Now we are going to get into uh, a number of, of trials with aspirin and, and ticagrelor and so forth, but I'd like to start with um, one study that to me is fascinating, uh, maybe not to you, but uh, it came up in Jack actually, I think today or yesterday. And it's the so-called related to the dual antiplatelet therapy score system. And let me give a little bit of background uh, with this score system. When the DAPT study that was generated actually in your institution, uh, Deepak, uh, came out, um, this all led to a number of score systems in time to predict who should be treated long term with dual antiplatelet therapy more than a year and who should not. And basically, the score, if I recall, was uh, sicker is the patient, more you have to move into dual antiplatelet therapy. Patients with acute MI and undergoing a stenting, uh, saphenous vein graft undergoing a stenting, uh, small diameters, I remember that, and then significant comorbidities, I don't know, renal failure, respiratory failure, and then risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, tobacco, all of this was pulled together into a score system, and if I recall, I think more than two points meant you have to, to give patient antiplatelet therapy, uh, certainly for more than a year, and if it was a score that was low, it would be less. All was very nice, but the, here's the problem with all these scoring systems. First of all, the stents used at that time were actually um, were uh, more of the older stents that they are used today, that's number one. Number two, the, the, data, the studies were not validated. It's a single study that was not validated by other studies, and those who tried to validate were short-term. So, in fact, there's a big gap between the score that came from that very well-done study, by the way, and what is going on today. So the Swedish decided to have a look on their fantastic registry that they have, you know, and, uh, and it's interesting. Uh, this study is based on the, on the Swedish registry with significant uh, number of patients, actually 41,000 patients uh, that were registered. And, um, and they had uh, DAPT, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, for 12 months. And then what happened after 12 months, basically they wanted to look at the score of DAPT, see if it worked on predictability. That's basically what they did. So what they compare is the original formula of, uh, of DAPT with what they found. And the way they are analyzed this, is statistically speaking, is important. Uh, the so-called uh, C-statistic, which is the score for discrimination and the score for calibration. I think this is very interesting. The score for discrimination is the C-score. That Basically, what it looks as, if you have a given individual, can you predict will have the event or not? And that's as simple as that. And there is a C-score, and ideal is to have a C-score of 1. If you have a C-score of 0 0.5, 0 0.6, is bad news. This is not working. And the second is, as you have a score system, higher is the risk, higher will be the number of events. So there is a parallelism. So the calibration score means there is a parallelism. Well, let me give you the results. Nothing worked here. The calibration score was 0 0.56 and was a U-wave, so there's no kind of parallelism. And the question that I'm going to ask you, what went wrong here, is that scores, there are 300 score systems today, were wrong, or the study are different stands at that time that they are now? And Gilles, I will ask you first, um, just give me a sense, because I am tired of his course, by the way. I, even I, I, wrote, a, I wrote an editorial <laughs> about too. it. But anyway, let's, let's listen to you. You, you know, we have, we have now books of scores in cardiology. So we have so many scores that nobody uh, uh, uses them most, most of the time. But here, this is a, an interesting study because the size is, is such that you can look at a, a, a population of coronary patients and test the score. But the situation is very different from the randomized study, where you had one group not treated. Here, everybody is being treated as the physicians want to treat the, the patient. So it, it, I think it's very difficult to adjust for the prolongation or not of treatment in such a population. They, they try to do it, but uh, 
uh, they don't have a control arm just like you have it in, in the randomized study. Mm -hmm. And now the values uh, of the C statistics are so low, so it, it's just a toss of a coin. So uh, it, it does not give confidence to use a DAPD score to take the decision to prolong or not. That, that's the, 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 the main conclusion of the, of the study. And I think many physicians will feel confident to, to follow this conclusion because they are lazy or they don't like the scores, but most of them say they, they don't use scores. Yeah. Deepak? Yeah, I've got to make a confession. I don't use any risk scores in clinical well, practice. Well, we are already three of us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I think they're interesting. I, I, I've participated in several. It makes for good papers, you know, but, yeah, but, but in terms of clinical practice, when you have an individual is, patient, it doesn't work. yeah, it doesn't really work. And, and the problem with many risk scores, including ones I've participated in, is that they aren't <clears throat> validated in multiple populations before use. You've got to validate in multiple different uh, real-world populations, different regions, different ethnicities, uh, both sexes, obviously, and, and unless that's done, it, it's impossible to apply them in real life, and, and very few risk scores ever meet that bar. Irina, are you a score person? I think, uh, yeah, I um, probably agree that good scores are very useful for clinicians just to uniform their practice. Because if we all go uh, uh, following our gut feeling is a good thing, but we need some evidence-based uh, uh, risk stratification. Can I challenge But not that? all scores will work, <laughs> I agree. And evaluation of scores is very difficult validation. National databases like this big numbers as immediately will blow us, you know, like, oh my God, that's a huge big data. But they are not complete. They are not that great because there is no much incentive in entering yeah. all information. And God knows how yeah. many events were simply missed. So we have to take this big registry data not prospective registries, but controlled registries with a pinch of salt. Common. Yeah, it's a good point you raise about evidence-based medicine, but we don't actually apply evidence-based medicine to risk scores. That is the right thing to do with a risk score beyond validating its ability to determine risk. That's important and rarely done. But even if that's done, what really needs to happen is randomization to risk score versus standard of care yes. to see if it actually improves yes. outcomes. Because if it doesn't improve outcomes, just the fact that it detects risk, you know, it's interesting, but it's not actionable. Yeah. I would just say the nice thing is that you get these whole integers, and so it kind of gives you a, a sign to each of the variables, which gives you a sort of a rough idea of how important those variables are. So as a clinician, that may be of some value, but I think most clinicians already know approximately which risk factors are more important than the other ones. And I know of no surgeon that, that sits and calculates these scores. <laughs> okay. Four against one. <laughs> <laughs> there are good things in some, you know, the STS score, for example. Yes. You, at least you can, when you, when you enter groups of patients, you know, at least what kind of an uh, individual you're dealing with, so... A good score is a good thing. Okay, good. A bad good. score is All right. a word. You, you made it. <laughs> All right, look, we are going now into... Uh, this was the... Now let's get into the aspirin take -agalor.